Hi, I'm Daniel Roth. I'm the executive editor of LinkedIn. We're pleased to have with us today Michael Powell, the CEO and president of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association and the former chairman of the FCC. Michael, thanks for joining us today. Great to be with you. Thank you. I want to talk to you a little bit about how you measure success. As the chairman of the FCC, you had constituents that you were working with. You had to represent all of America and deal with these massive companies. Now you have companies who are in 90% of U.S. households, either their cable or their content is showing up in everyone's homes. How do you know that you're doing the right thing? How are you sure that the, the, uh, the moves you're making are the right ones, and how do you measure success? It's a great question because there's a certain abstraction to our business, right? I don't have a bottom line p and L. I can't say we made this much money this quarter or that quarter. Washington is a kind of uh, amorphous place. How are you doing well? How are you doing poorly? Of course, you can measure headline risk. You know, you got regulated or, you, or you, you were able to deregulate a particular rule. That certainly constitutes success. But when I got there, I realized you had to really find other measures of what the way I describe it is that we are progressing that we are moving forward, right? That, that we're not stagnant or moving backwards. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've learned is you can't be a secretariat. You can't sit back and sort of wait for them to come to some consensus to tell you what you want to do. You really need to sit down. I look forward over the course of the next year. Certain things are anticipatable. You identify. But one of the ways I like to do it is sort of old-fashioned scenario planning analysis because you can't really know the path, but you can know three or four or five likely directions something's going to take. So we like to put those up on the board and say, let's, let's manage against all five of these. So we do have a strategic planning process. We identify that. But you know, as great leaders once taught me, plans don't survive the first contact with the enemy. Right. And it's, you know, our business is really about adaptation and um, your ability to change direction quickly based on the intelligence you're receiving at the moment. And that's probably one of the highest things we value. Hmm. We talked to so many business leaders today, and they discuss, they talk about risk, they talk about embracing yeah. failure. Do you think about going after risk, do you, or do you tell your staff to, to not be afraid to fail, or is that something you can't yeah. afford to do? I, I, I think you do, but it's a, it has slightly different character than the way it would manifest itself inside, say, a startup or a big company. Um, you know, in many ways, the, 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 the greatest enemy in an organization and like mind is, is stagnation, mediocrity because mediocrity will fly. To me, risk is, put another way, is do you take initiative? Mm. Do you see the undone and do it without asking? Do you see the opportunity to fix something without ask, waiting for a plan? That's risk too, because if you're comfortable and you realize, hey, I don't know that there's anything to be gained by going out of my way, but yet you have to empower people to say, no, 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 that's highly valuable. Uh, one of the best things I want to see is that somebody took care of something and never had to bring it to me, never had to hear about it, didn't have to have a meeting, just made it happen. Uh, and worse, the ones I value the best, the ones I value the most, are say, we've always done it this way, why? Break the glass, go ahead. You will never be punished by me uh, for taking a well-calculated risk. And when you're hiring, what kind of people do you look for? So um, you want people who are passionate, who are really enthusiastic. Um, you want people who are creative. I think communication skills are super valuable. And I don't mean, you know, can you just post on Facebook and Twitter? I mean, can you speak? Can you represent? Can you write? Um, can you find the insight through language um, to the kind of thing that's going to move someone? Um, we look for that a lot. Um, you know, so writing communication skills may be one of the highest things we value. I'm a big person about chemistry. Uh, you could have the best credentials on the planet. You could have worked every great company in the world. But I will sit there and value very heavily, do you fit in? Will you make the soup around here spicier or, or more bland? And you have to be a team player. But, but brilliance also often emerges from sort of individual solitude. Um, I don't like meetings where I ask my staff their opinion. I prefer to wander around the building and ask opinions individually and then digest them and integrate them myself, then bring them together for a conversation. I don't like the, let's just throw it on the whiteboard. Why don't I run around and see? Because I think people often are intimidated by the group. Some people withdraw in the group. There's a great book out called Quiet, The Power of Introversion, sure. which I read. It sort of warned me about the potential of people you're not taking full advantage of because they don't work well in that, in that dynamic. You're not an introvert yourself. Take it. You know what's funny is I actually think I am. Um, I think I am more extroverted who learned the skills of, of, of being on. You know, it's a, it's a responsibility of leadership, it's a responsibility of, of my upbringing, my training. But when given my own devices, I will probably be 
happy to be quiet inside my own house, reading or doing something that can, you know, I can be silent for a very long time, but my staff would probably laugh at that notion. Um, but for example, you know, we're the cable industry. Every single office in my uh, spaces has a television, of course. They're all tuned to CNN. You know, everybody's pretending to be highbrow watching the news. Um, my TV's never on. I just don't ever have my television on. I would prefer the room to be quiet. I'd prefer to be kind of inside myself thinking. And so, I don't know, I think I'm an introvert with extroversion skills or something. All right. <laughs> it seems like one of the things that you focus on a lot uh, is the idea of understanding what people's motivations are, or what companies' yes. motivations are. And I've heard you talk about Netflix, Netflix paying Comcast, mm -hmm. and your point is they need to get the content in to, to the homes in the way that is fast and cheap, and they'll find the best way for them. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're always looking for, is the idea of what motivates someone is trying to understand in the room what everyone's motivation is? Yeah, I think, um, by the way, this is sort of almost Buddhist, right? I mean, look, I try not to ever get angry or emotional at anything. You know, stop for a second, take a breath, and try to understand where that person's coming. What, are the, what is it that's causing that agitation? There's always a story a couple layers down from the message. And if you drink the message right away, particularly in our society now that's just filled with slick messaging and everybody's figured out ways to sort of talk their way out of paperbacks, I'm always like, don't li I don't want to hear that. I want to go down three levels and find out what's, what's the motivation for that. And I always try to start there because I think the better you understand both your, your colleagues and your opponents, um, the more effective you are. You know, that's why I spend a lot of time even knowing what's going on in the lives of my employees. If I see somebody who seems sad, I really quickly try to figure out why. Well, is there something going on I should know about? Not because I'm nosy, because I want to know, are they hurting worse than I realize and they need help? If a CEO's not spending 75 or more percent of their time every day on their own people, then they probably have misplaced priorities. At the end of the day, I don't build anything, I don't make anything, I don't shoot television shows, um, I don't do as well as my media team does what they do, I don't do as well what my lawyers do as they do. I, I, I count and depend on them reaching excellence. And what they need from me is to provide them the environment, the context, the vision, and the direction to do what they do well. And I should spend a good chunk of my day worrying about whether I'm doing my job, which is making their job uh, have the right conditions for excellence. And I was taught this in the Army, um, believe it or not. You know, you think of an Army as a unit. This is a battalion. This is a brigade. This is, you know, and, and, and you're like George S. Patton. You stand in front of a hundred troops and lecture them, and they all go to war for you. It's not the way soldiering is actually done. What it really is done is one 18-year-old kid at a time. You know, when I was a 22-year-old lieutenant and I had 46, you know, young men who worked for me from every walk of life, you know, and if a kid left Harlem to find a better life, he joined the Army, never lived in anywhere overseas, and suddenly he's your responsibility. I mean, I've had to take soldiers and get them out of jail. I've had to take soldiers to the bank because they overdrew and they didn't know what a check was. I've had to take soldiers downtown because they brought a wife over when they weren't supposed to and some landlords abusing them and I had to go there. That's soldiering because the day I ask him to do something extreme, to put his life in danger, he better believe in me. He better be sat He better not be worrying about his wife's well-being at home. He better not be worrying whether he's healthy, happy, or fed. You know, soldiering is a one guy at a time business and the good ones do that and the bad ones don't. So um, I, th I think you can't lead organizations in ma as a mass. Mm -hmm. 